Hello, this is Joseph Holbrook. I am uh, teaching religion in Latin America, and this is the introduction to the course. And uh, this is taken from Justo Gonzalez, Christianity in Latin America. This is the introductory chapter. I will also be using some material later on in this course from a edited volume of interpretive essays by Penyak and Petri called Religion and Society in Latin America. So, let's jump in. Um, so in the introduction, there's a particular apocryphal scene. We don't know if it's how historically accurate it is, but Charles V, the uh, emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, was uh, in a carriage going through Madrid, and someone stopped his carriage. He was annoyed. And he asked who had dared block his carriage, and it would, uh, who had dared block the carriage of the Roman imp, Holy Roman Emperor, the King of Castile, the King of Leon, Aragon, and the two Sicilies. And the response was that it was Hernan Cortes, the one who gave thee more lands than did thy father. Hernan Cortes, of course, was the Spaniard conquistador who launched out from Cuba and arrived in Mexico and conquered the Aztec Empire for Spain, adding all of, uh, adding a huge chunk of North America and Central America to the, uh, uh, to the uh, lands of Charles V that he ruled over and opening the way for the further conquest of South America. So, Hernan Cortez is an important character in this story. He also lived roughly at the same time as Martin Luther, the uh, famous German reformer. And, of course, there were religious wars going on at this time in Europe, and the, Holy, the Roman Catholic Church lost a good bit of Europe in the Protestant Reformation, but it gained much more territory and wealth from the... Uh, newly conquered lands of the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so Hernan Cortes not only destroyed the Aztec Empire, but he also disrupted traditional economic and political patterns in Europe. The whole Colombian exchange, foods changed, diseases traveled across the Atlantic, uh, religion traveled across the Atlantic. He gave Charles V more lands than did his father, but he also provided him with gold and silver to pay the enormous debt he contracted in order to become the Holy Roman Emperor. And this also led to uh, Spain buying its products from the emerging England and Holland, who uh, began to industrialize with Spanish silver and gold, leading to, uh, uh, leading to uh, some economic problems in Spain. Sugar became uh, an important product in the New World, which led to slavery as well as uh, cultivation of coffee. All of this we can uh, thank Hernan Cortes for opening the door, as well as Christopher Columbus, to uh, these cha massive changes. The Reconquista, in order to understand uh, the Catholic Church in Latin America, one must understand Spanish, medieval Spanish Catholicism. It was militant Catholicism. It was shaped and forged in the 800-year Reconquista. The Reconquista is a, a period in which uh, Germanic Spaniards in the northern part of Spain fought against the Muslim Moors in the middle and south uh, who had conquered Spain. And for 800 years, they did warfare to push the Moors back further south. And eventually, in uh, 1492, uh, Ferdinand and Isabella prevailed and uh, took the last holdout, which I believe was Granada, and united all of Spain under a Catholic monarchy. The Spanish were not hypocrites. Uh, we can look at their actions today and judge them by today's standards, their brutality, their uh, oppression, uh, but they were operating by a different set of standards from the medieval period, they were not hypocrites. They believed sincerely that they were serving God. Santiago Matamoros, or St. James the Moorslayer, was the patron saint of Spain. 
uh, that was of medieval Spain. And he was believed to have come to Spain, one of the disciples of Christ, or maybe it was the brother of Christ. And he uh, gradually morphed into a military figure attacking and fighting with Spanish troops against the Moors. The Camino to uh, Santiago uh, is one of the holiest pilgrimages in Europe, and it's devoted to uh, St. James, uh, El, or Santiago uh, Matamoros. There's a famous saying in Spanish, uh, con el mazo, adios orando y con el mazo dando. The, the phrase translated into English is praying to God and beating out their brains with the mace. So uh, this is a different kind of, this is a militant Christianity, one might say. Uh, the next point we want to make is that there's two faces of Latin American Catholicism. This is a point that Justo Gonzalez makes quite well. He uh, emphasizes the fact that Catholicism is Janus-faced, or that it has two faces looking in two directions. Uh, and this is essential for understanding actually the, to understanding churches anywhere but particularly Latin American Catholicism. The conquistadores were certain of the ultimate goal of all of life was the salvation of one's soul and therefore they were prone to believe that this justified violence, oppression, and destruction if necessary to save the soul. The destruction of the flesh to save the soul. The church in Latin America had two faces. The dominant face was the one that justified what was being done in the name of evangelization. Also, the dominant face would be the one throughout the uh, following centuries that justified the uh, hierarchy, justified the elite, uh, legitimized oppressive governments. Uh, the other face is the one of Bartolome de las Casas, the Dominican priest who fought to defend the rights of the indigenous and many other uh, saintly uh, Roman Catholic priests and nuns who stood up against uh, social injustice and oppression, uh, culminating in the 20th century with liberation theology and a number of martyrs who died in the name of social justice, such as uh, Oscar Romero. So the, as you look at Latin American Catholicism or Protestantism, Pentecostalism, you will always see two faces. One might even speculate and say, based on the incarnation of Christ, it might be the face of God and the face of man. The two faces of Christianity in Latin America have persisted throughout the centuries. When Spain's American colonies began their quest for independence, most leaders in the institutional church in the hierarchy, who were from the upper classes, opposed that quest. They opposed independence. They opposed democracy. They opposed the ideas of constitutional government and republicans, republics. But there were also priests such as uh, Padres Hidalgo and Morelos in Mexico who became leaders of the movement for independence. Uh, religion and daily life. So one of the things that Justo Gonzalez focuses on is he always traces out the difference between the institution and the daily practice. Uh, the, the official theology, the official uh, positions of the institutions, the bureaucracy, is one thing. The daily practice of the actual people, or what is known as popular Catholicism or popular religion, is something entirely different. And as much as possible, uh, Justo Gonzalez tries to bring into the discussion the daily practice or popular Catholicism as well as institutional. The Franciscans, uh, in their early zeal, which I'll talk about at a later date, the uh, Franciscans in Mexico baptized millions with, uh, in just a short number of years with very little required. It was actually impossible that they could have understood what they were committing to. These multitudes of indigenous Nahuatl speaking and other indigenous groups that were being baptized into the Catholic Church without even even without even being able to speak Spanish or read scriptures or receive any teachings. Uh, African slaves were quickly baptized with little teaching on the ships 
as they were loaded onto the ships or as they were offloaded in Cartagena or Veracruz, they were baptized uh, and then put into uh, put to work in, in sugar plantations and other situations. Syncretism was an unavoidable. Syncretism is when two religions are combined and the symbols are mixed and matched and combined into a new religion. That's syncretism. Uh, uh, Fernando Ortiz in Cuba calls it transculturation. So you take a little bit of Yoruba and a little bit of Catholicism, you mix them together, and you come up with some creative alternatives. And this is syncretism between saints, Catholic saints, the Virgin Mary, on the one hand, and on the other hand, indigenous uh, indigenous uh, deities or African gods. One example of this would be when the uh, when the uh, peasant, Nahuatl speaking peasant in Mexico City, Juan Diaz, had an apparition of the Virgin Mary, but she was a mulatto or a dark skinned looking Virgin Mary who appeared to him and asked for a chapel to be built in her name. He went to the bishop a couple times, actually, and finally persuaded the bishop that it was a legitimate app apparition of Mary. Uh, the interesting thing is that the chapel to the Virgin of Guadalupe is built directly over the uh, Aztec goddess Tonitzan, who was the earth eater, the filth eater, the, uh, the mother goddess who took away the sins of Aztecs. And so there's a comp there's some kind of mixing and matching going on between the Aztec deity and the uh, Catholic Virgin. Um, also, there's the uh, Santeria practiced in Miami and in Cuba, which is a combination of Yoruban gods and goddesses and beliefs with Catholic names, Catholic uh, saint names. There's a similar form of religion that is derived from Yoruba in Brazil called Candomblé. There's also uh, voodoo in Haiti, which is not from Yoruba. It's from an entirely different African uh, ethnic group. But once again, to some degree combined with Catholicism. Protestants came along in the 19th century and intended to dismiss all of this as paganism and superstition. When Vatican II uh, came about in 1962 through 1965, uh, the Catholic Church tried, attempted to untangle these popular popular beliefs from Orthodox religion rather unsuccessfully. We are going to be looking at some main turning points in this uh, series. We'll begin with the pre-Columbian, uh, pre-Columbian American uh, or indigenous Amerindian uh, societies and religious beliefs. We'll also talk about the Iberian uh, Catholicism and societies, Portuguese, Portuguese and Spanish. Then we'll talk about the arrival of Christianity in the New World. Uh, we'll talk about the, the colonial church in, in the Spanish and Portuguese colonies, the Portuguese colony being Brazil, the Spanish colonies stretching from Argentina uh, across to Chile and up through the Andean region, uh, Bolivia, Peru, uh, Ecuador to uh, Colombia and then around to Venezuela and up through Central America into uh, Mexico, and also in the Caribbean islands. Uh, so we'll discuss the, the colonial Catholic Church during that period in that area. We'll also be talking about uh, reform movements after the 19th century and into the 20th century. And uh, we'll be talking eventually about liberalism, which was a political philosophy that favored Protestants, and separation of church and state, and then we'll talk about the arrival and expansion of Protestantism in the 20th and, I'm sorry, the 19th and the 20th centuries through immigration originally, then later through missions. And then finally, in the 20th century, we'll look at the explosion of Pentecostalism. And then by the end of the, uh, or actually the middle to the end of the 20th century, we'll look at Vatican II and liberation theology. And then the 21st century, we will see re new religious movements that are syncretistic or uh, mixing and matching of different kinds of religious trends and globalization. We'll be talking about how Latin American religion has exploded across the globe 
and there are uh, Brazilian and Spanish speaking missionaries all over the world from different churches. So that is our introduction to religion in Latin America. I hope to see you next week. Thank you very much for your attention.